Hi, I'm Kevin. Welcome to my cave. Today I'd like to cover a simple op-amp circuit that I somehow missed when we were going over the linear feedback circuits, the difference amplifier. Just as the subbing amp adds the voltages at its inputs, perhaps with weights, the difference amp subtracts them. To build a difference amplifier, let's start with an ordinary inverter like the one we looked at two episodes ago. It takes its input voltage and produces an equal and opposite voltage on its output. Newcomers to op-amp circuits all seem to think that you could make a difference amplifier simply by ungrounding the non-inverting input of the op-amp, and instead feeding the other input signal directly to it. But this isn't quite right. Can you see why? Well, without doing a complete analysis yet, let's just try grounding the inverting input. You might recognize this circuit as the non-inverting amplifier from episode 2. The divider ratio for the feedback network is 1 to 2, so the amplifier's gain is 2. That's the wrong answer. A difference amplifier would need to have a gain of 1. Okay then, let's analyze what actually happens using our golden rules. The inverting input of the op-amp is the result of a voltage divider between the output and the inverting input of the circuit. The non-inverting input of the op-amp is just the non-inverting input of the circuit. And the negative feedback loop is holding these two voltages equal. It's pretty trivial to solve for the output voltage. Once we've written the equation out this way, it's pretty clear what we need to do to fix our circuit. Just feed in half the voltage to the non-inverting terminal with a second voltage divider. That will give us the function we actually need, because we will have cut V sub B in half. Let me run an example here. As usual, I have a schematic on the project GitHub. There's a link somewhere nearby. I have my phone running a music player, and I connect its headphone jack to my circuit with a short patch cable. I have no idea what the phone's idea of ground is, other than that the sleeve of the headphone jack is probably grounded. I've got a bunch of resistors that serve to give the headphone jack the 32 ohm load that it expects, and drive an output with an output resistance of about 100 ohms. I'm running the signal through a few feet of unshielded twisted pair. I know that's a dreadful idea, but bear with me here. This little breadboard has that part, with the headphone jack and the telephone cable. Then I've built a circuit with termination resistors for the twisted pairs, and then a diff amp built with 10k resistors. The signal arrives here at a relatively low voltage, so I'm boosting it with a gain of 100 before sending it off to the speaker amplifier that we built in the last episode. It's not a great speaker amplifier, but I still had it on a breadboard. I've clipped on a second breadboard with the twisted pair termination, diff amp, and gain block. So let me turn on the power, start up the music player, and listen to the result, and watch it on the scope. The yellow trace has the difference signal as it goes into the speaker amp. The yellow trace has the difference signal as it goes into the speaker amp. It looks nice and clean. The cyan and the magenta traces are the two wires of the twisted pair. I won't inflict them on your ears. There's enough 60 hertz hum and computer noise to ruin your enjoyment of the music. But my phone's running a little low. I'd have better plug in the charger. My ears! What the heck? Well, with the volume turned down to zero, let's have a look at those input traces. Good heavens, there's a lot of 60 hertz stuff. It turns out that's not all that uncommon on USB chargers. 
The open circuit potential on the ground connection can be any voltage up to and including the full voltage of the AC power line. Safety regulations require it not be able to source more than 250 microamps of current. That means that what the phone thinks of as ground might actually look like the AC power line, dropped through a resistor of about 480k. That's going to our circuit, with all its current passing through a divider with two 10k resistors. 120 volts RMS is 340 volts peak to peak, and the divider ratio here is 50 to 1 so we could see up to 6.8 volts of common mode signal at our input. Or our input's plural, I should say, since the same common mode signal will appear at the other side of our circuit. So the common mode voltages balance. What's the problem here? Well, we're dealing with 1% tolerance on the resistor values. Let's look at the worst case for resistors out of balance. The voltage at the non-inverting terminal of the op-amp will be 1% higher than nominal, a negative feedback ensures that the voltage at the inverting terminal will be the same. That determines the current through the inverting input resistor, and the current through the feedback resistor will be the same, which means that the common mode feed through at the output can be over 100 millivolts. The quiet passages of the music gave a signal of only a few tens of millivolts. No wonder that 60 hertz buzz was deafening. What can we do about this? For a single-ended input, one fairly common thing to try is to break up the ground loop between the remote and local devices with a simple filter. A low-value resistor provides a DC connection between the grounds, while a capacitor rolls off the impedance at higher frequencies. That will often cut the common mode hash to a manageable level. Let's try that on the breadboard circuit. Here's that single-ended configuration on the breadboard. Let's start the music player. Listen to it on the speaker, and see it on the scope. As I said, the configuration is a little bit more forgiving. But when I plug in the charger... The 60 Hz buzz is still there, even though it's no longer drowning out the music. We'd need a better resistor match, or a package diff amp to deal with it. For the first option, better matched resistors, the Shea makes some surface mount packages of four 10K resistors, where the spec is that any resistor matches with any other to within 0.05%. The distributors sell the four packs of that quality for about a dollar a piece in hobbyist quantities, so that wouldn't break the bank. You can get ones up to five times better than that. For about 30 times the price. A better solution would be to use a package difference amplifier. This year's inexpensive one for audio applications appears to be the INA-134. It's a couple or three bucks in hobbyist quantities. It includes the op amp and four trimmed resistors in a single package. It's a low distortion op amp, and it's supposed to have a typical 90 decibel, minimum 74 decibel, of common mode rejection. The cheapest of the Vichet resistor arrays would give us only 66 decibels. In professional audio gear, you see these different amps all over the place, handling the input signals from XLR connectors. That's such a common application that the manufacturers call them audio line receivers. There's also a companion circuit an audio line driver that uses two differential amps to produce a differential signal from a single-ended one. That's what you usually see at the other end of the XLR cable. There's another trick the difference amps have up their sleeve. They're capable of taking a voltage that's beyond the supply rails and bringing it into range accurately and at low impedance. Let's say I have an input signal coming from, well, I don't know where. In particular, I want to break any ground loops, so I'll use the same sort of filter that we just saw. My input signal will be oscillating around ground. But I want the circuit that's processing the signal to use a single power supply, so I want to bring that signal into the middle of the supply span. Well, let's start processing it with a difference amplifier. We'll begin by looking at the inverting configuration. That means that we'll be sending the input signal to the inverting input and connecting the remote ground to the non-inverting input. 
We'll tie the reference input of the diff amp to half the supply voltage. Oh, I guess I haven't described this input as a reference input before. The idea behind the name is that it becomes the reference voltage for the diff amp's output. It simply gets added to the difference between the two input voltages. Giving it half the supply voltage means that the output will get boosted by that voltage. I'll let you do the algebra if you need convincing. It's essentially the same calculation that we just did. This is like the biasing that we did for transistor circuits with a single supply and a coupling capacitor. We're centering the signal in our voltage range. But there's no capacitor blocking the DC component of our input voltage. There's no need for a big electrolytic, and we can take the input signal all the way down to DC if we want. Of course, having the reference input at half the supply voltage is awkward. We probably need a voltage divider to supply it, plus an op-amp follower to make sure that it's at a low impedance. But there's another easy trick. The voltage at the op-amp's not inverting input is coming from a divider between ground and half the supply voltage. The divider ratio is one half, so the voltage is a quarter of the supply voltage. Can't we create the voltage from the main supply by changing that divider ratio to one quarter? Yeah, that works. It will allow a small amount of common mode feed through because the divider is referring to the remote ground, but we can often put up with that. Of course, we don't always want an inverting configuration. We can use the same sort of trick for the non-inverting configuration, but with different values. The divider on the non-inverting input will have a 1 to 3 ratio rather than 1 to 4, and we need the same 1 to 3 divider on the inverting input. I'll let you verify for yourself that if we use these ratios, we'll get a differential mode gain of 1 and a zero common mode gain. We've done the algebra several times already, so I won't bore you with it. Instead, I'll just demonstrate these two single-ended circuits. Here's the circuit that I'm going to build. I'm using an LMC64H2 dual op amp. That's my current go-to op amp when I want single supply or battery powered operation. Because it works at relatively low voltage, and its inputs and outputs can go all the way to the rails. It's fairly cheap and widely available. Its specs aren't terrific, but I often don't need better. I've used 10K for the base resistance, because 20K and 30K are also standard 5% values. But it's worth noting that I could have used arrays of 10K resistors and gotten better matching among them if I needed. I could build the 20 and 30K with series combinations of those. A 16-pin SOIC with 8 10K resistors matched to 250 parts per million costs only a few bucks. Here it is on the breadboard. There's not too much to say about it. It just sort of sits there. I have my function generator coming in at the left, and I'm monitoring the input signal, the inverting output, and the non-inverting output on three scope channels. I'll give it a 4-volt sine wave. On the scope, I see input swinging around ground, while the two output channels, one inverting and one non-inverting, are both centered neatly on 4.5 volts. To show that the response goes all the way to DC, I can dial a DC offset into the function generator, and the traces move up and down accordingly. So we have DC response. You can actually carry this beyond the rails capability out to a ludicrous extent. The INA149, for instance, boasts a plus or minus 275 volt common mode input range, plus the ability to withstand momentary overloads of plus or minus half a kilovolt. The manufacturer suggests it for monitoring currents in high voltage circuits, or for monitoring the voltages of individual cells in high voltage battery stacks, such as you see in off grid power applications. It's kind of interesting to see how it works. For split supply operation, ordinarily you'll ground both reference pins. That'll make the voltage at the non inverting input of the op amp be the voltage at pin 3 times the divider ratio, which is 1 over 21. Of course, if the negative feedback loop works, the voltage at the inverting input will be the same. The current out of pin 1 will be that voltage divided by 20k, 
or the pin 3 voltage divided by 420k. The current out of pin 2 can be obtained by Ohm's law with the voltage drop across its resistor. And we'll separate the two terms. Now let's look at the current in the feedback resistor. It'll be the sum of the pin 1 and pin 2 currents. We're still assuming the op amp inputs draw no current. We'll group the terms with the non-inverting voltage, and we'll use Ohm's law with the feedback resistor. Distribute the 380k inside the brackets, and things start to cancel out. In fact, we find that the output voltage is just the difference of the voltages on pins 2 and 3. So this thing is a unity gain amplifier as advertised. By the way, you can get even higher voltage versions of these. The AD8479 has a common mode range of 600 volts and can survive a 10 second over voltage of 900 volts. Voltage and current monitoring is an important use for differential amplifiers in general. When I was measuring current mirrors in an earlier episode, I used this circuit. There's a difference amp that's measuring the voltage drop at the output side of the mirror, and a more sophisticated version called an instrumentation amp that measures the voltage drop across a small resistor to measure the current that the mirror is putting out. I promise I'll cover instrumentation amps in a later episode, but in this circuit you can think of it as a difference amp with programmable gain. There are many other tricks that package difference amps can play. By moving the reference and sense connections around, you can make precision amps with gains of plus one, minus two, two, and one half, precision summing and averaging circuits, rail splitters, and a whole raft of other things. The precisely trimmed resistors can be put into play for a wide variety of precision circuits. If you're interested in what these puppies can do, I recommend looking at the data sheet for the INA105. It's got dozens of sample circuits. I think this is a good place to wrap up for this time. I've given you at least a taste of what a difference amp can do, and now you'll know to recognize the classic topology of four resistors around an op amp. Next time in this series, I'll get back to nonlinear devices in the feedback loop. I'd look at uses for a diode there other than the logarithmic amplifier we saw last time. I hope you'll stay tuned for that, and perhaps let the algorithm know you'd like to be notified when it comes out. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious, and take care of one another. Bye!